Okay, so we're about to make a start for today. So, um, yeah, any questions about uh, the module before we go on? Okay, so today we're very lucky to have Simon Tadwick here to talk to us again, and he's brought his reproduction of the Queen Mary Hart, but he'll tell me more about it later. And so, basically, this lecture is going to be about the early Gallic Harp and um, uh, the wire strung instrument predominantly, uh, but he'll cover other aspects of the tradition as well. And uh, yeah, so Simon started off in archaeology and uh, has taken a great interest and become a specialist in this instrument. So without further ado, Simon Tadwick. Okay. So I'm going to talk today about the harp in Scotland and in Scottish music, which is kind of a challenge because it's a big subject. But I thought I thought we'd start. If, you, if, if, if I say to you, the harp, can, can, I, can everyone think of one word that springs to mind? What kind of words do you think of associated with the harp? Instant reaction. Instant reaction. Strings. Yeah, yeah. Fantasy. Fantasy. Kind of Any other? This is kind of what I was expecting. I always think that you think of kind of ancient beauty and romance and you know, emotional and this kind of thing. But who, who, who would have thought of intellectual or learned or aristocratic or ceremonial? Because th these are the, I think these are the these are the kind of concepts that, for most of its history in Scotland, these these are the concepts that the, the heart was most connected to. Okay. So, the, so the harp was the, the number one high status, ceremonial, aristocratic, learned musical instrument. Okay. But it also has with it a load of romantic baggage, basically, this kind of symbolic, iconic role. And so this is why I've chosen this picture for, for my cover picture, because I think this kind of for me, this encapsulates all these different aspects of what the harp is doing in Scotland. So here we have our aristocratic gentleman poet. This is, this is the frontispiece of his self-published collection of poetry. So he's sitting there with his notebook, waiting for the muse to strike. And he has his piper making a lot of noise. So the piper is the kind of very audible symbol of his Scottish romantic artistic endeavours. But the piper is away, you know, the other side of the barrier, because you don't want the piper to be too, too close, it's too noisy. So, so I like, I'm interested in that. He's there with these kind of distant. But on the table next to him, alongside his family manuscript, is the harp. But the harp is not being played. It's lying down on its back, like mine is. And this harp that he has doesn't actually work. It's, it's, um, it's a kind of stage pop kind of harp. It's, it's now in the West Highland Museum in Port William. It's not a working musical instrument. It's a, it's a sideboard ornament. So I think that's great that he has it there. And, and such an intimate companion for his poetic muse. It doesn't actually make any noise. And he couldn't play it. And nobody else has to play it. You see what I mean? So, so, so I love that kind of... There's two sides to it. And the symbolic, silent side is... Often, <coughs> often uppermost, especially in the modern world. So when we talk about the harp in Scottish music, we instantly have a problem because for most of its history, there was no such thing as Scottish music as a, as a defined thing. Um, so what I like to think about is the old Gallic world. And so this is... This is a kind of cultural continuum that goes right down to Kerry at the bottom of Ireland and right up the west coast of Scotland. So this is, so this is the area where Gaelic is traditionally spoken and it's a very coherent cultural area. And the further back in time you look, the more connections there were between them. So before the military roads were built in the 18th century, and it, it was very hard to get from England and the south and west of Scotland up over the mountains into the west coast. Before the military roads were built, it was far easier to use boats to go backwards and forwards across the North Channel. And so that area in the north of Ireland and to Argyll, I think of that as like the kind of Heathrow Airport and M25 
of the old Gallic world. That's where everything was happening. That's where people were back and forth all the time. People were meeting, people were, people were doing all their cultural stuff. And so that's where, that, that, that center of that map is the kind of heartland of this old Gallic world. And so I always want to bear this in mind when we're talking about the medieval and the ancient heart traditions, you can't constrain yourself to modern national boundaries. You have to be aware of the ancient cultural areas. And so I'll talk a lot about what was happening in Ireland, because it's vitally important to understanding what was happening in Scotland, because they were so intimately connected. So, so when, we, when we talk about the harp, every, everybody thinks, well, one, one of the buzzwords for the harp is ancient. You know, the harp is such an ancient musical instrument. If you look at the classic society, they say the harp is the oldest of the Scottish instruments. So everyone's obsessed with this kind of ancientness of it. And so it's interesting to have a look at how ancient can you go. And this is kind of, this is kind of your limit. So you, so, so you go back to the 9th century, perhaps even to the 8th century, and you get these Pictish stones. People call them Pictish stones. Most of them are from the east of Scotland. So the Monifeith Cross Slab is now, is, is now in the National Museum, but it used to be um, on the coast. You know, you know when you look north from the castle and you see that coast in the distance, the old South Dundee, it, it's, it's along that coast there, it's where that stone comes from. And the Duckling Cross is down the other end of Fife from here, so out towards the Kinloss area, south of Perth. And these are very enigmatic, so you have these kind of cross slabs and they have these fuzzy cartoon figures on, and sometimes there's a figure sitting down with a triangular stripey thing in front of him. People get very excited because these are the oldest harp artifacts in Scotland. And what can we tell about these musical instruments and the music that's played on them? Absolutely nothing, basically, because all we've got is an abraded stone with a triangular spiky thing on it. So we know nothing about what's going on here. Doesn't stop people trying, doesn't stop people making Pictish harps and selling them commercially and doing concerts. Pictish music with them, but it's, it's all a kind of creative fantasy interpretation because all we have is these fuzzy pictures that are blurry and out of focus. And some people have even argued that this is not even evidence for the use of harps in Scotland because these could have just been copied from Byzantine carpets or something like that, you know, manuscript books. Because the other scenes, are all, I think they're all Old Testament scenes. I think they're illustrating scenes from the Bible. And so I think it's just King David. So, not, there's lots of questions about this. You know, you can you can push it in any direction, but I think the answer has to be we have no idea what's going on here, and we never will. And this theme of um, the harp as a symbol of King David is very strong all through medieval times. So this is um, this is. Paris Beatrice's psalm book. She was, um, she was at Iona, connected to the Lords of the Isles, very high status, very aristocratic, and in there in her psalm book is the, is the harp. But this has nothing to do with the harp in Scotland because this book was illustrated in Oxford as part of the whole continental tradition. And so this is just absolutely standard. You know, when you're doing a psalm book, you draw a picture of King David playing the harp, well, playing a triangle strike you bring, but again, we can say nothing about this. Is, this is not ethnog ethnography or photorealism. This is just total symbolism, totally abstract, totally disconnected from the real world of music. Here's another King David. This is the same scene that I showed you on Tuesday with the lady playing the lute. And this is interesting because this connects into that whole 17th century concept of what music is. So you can see that King David is reading from a book. Okay. His harp is, is can, you see what, can you see his harp has a slightly unusual shape? It's very pointed and tall and thin and slender. And this, and this is um, a continental style of medieval harp. And so there's various things you can take from this. One is that the, the continental style of harp tradition was quite strong in Scotland all through medieval times. Okay, there's always been foreign musicians in, 
And that whole tradition has to be placed in the medieval Scottish life, although it's almost invisible now, except in images like this. So this is another thing to be aware of. It's not just a native tradition. There are, there are sharing in the international traditions as well as quite separate, different things. And the book reminds me to say to you that, sure, there's the book, and, and the book would be important for continental traditions, like with the loot, but in the native traditions, there's no writing. It's all an oral tradition. But I think I'll come back to that later. The other thing anybody thinks of when, you, when they think of the harp in Scotland is the classic, the Gaelic harp, the, the, the ancient west. Okay. And so if we go out west, here's a late medieval grave slab, one of the whole series of amazing <coughs> West Highland carved stones. Um, and there's three, I think, that have harpers on them. And uh, it's very hard to read this. There's an inscription at the top of the stone, and it's so abraded that you can't read it, which is very disappointing. So we don't know whose stone this was, or, but we almost can. Some people have read it and said, yes, it's called Nicholas. It's not, very, it's not very useful. And so there's, whole, there's all these questions about what's going on here. You have these symbolic animals at the bottom whose tails turn into foliage, which matches some of the artwork on the heart. And then are we looking at symbols of lordship or status? You've got a man riding a horse. There's a kind of hunting hound lying down in the bottom left panel. And there's a man playing a harp. Is this a harpist grave slab? Or is it the grave side of some aristocratic lord who retained a professional harper? And we don't know. But still, there's nothing much we can tell about the, the instrument or the music, is there? It's not even stripy, it's just triangular. But you get the idea, yeah. The harper has a symbolic value, it's there. You can start imagining, you can start fantasizing, you can start making stuff up. And you can take it wherever you want. And then it all kind of suddenly clunks into reality because, there's, because there, are, there are surviving late medieval or early modern harps in the museum in Edinburgh. Okay? So, we go, so we go in one bump from the utterly abstract empty symbol that could be anything to the actual m musical instrument sitting there untouched for hundreds of years having, but which had been played. Okay? So there are two ancient harps in Scotland. And this one's called the Lamont harp, because each, each of them is, they're not archaeological objects, they haven't been dug up out of the ground, they've been preserved and curated non-stop since they were made. They've been kept in somebody's house and <coughs> known about. So there's a lot of stories and traditions about them. Not all of which might be true, not all of which are coherent. <coughs> So they have names. This is the Lamont harp, and it's connected to the Lamont family in late medieval times. And you can see it's pretty beaten up. I mean, I imagine, like, how many times has this dropped down a spiral staircase? <laughs> and then repaired, and then kept on playing, and then dropped again, and then repaired again. So there's, there's all, you see the, the left-hand side, there's all these kind of cracks and rivets, and then the rivets are cracked, and the strap has been put on, and the strap is bent. So there's a, there's a, kind, of, there's a kind of life story here. This is like a kind of an elderly person covered in scars and medals and photographs and anecdotes. You know, this, this thing embodies within it hundreds of years of music and practical, real-life music making. And that's very interesting. And one of my colleagues has just completed a PhD at Edinburgh University studying these two harps and doing a kind of forensic analysis of them to try and unpick some of that story. So inspecting the sequence of breaks, repairs, re-breaks, re-repairs, to try and unpick what's the sequence of events, what caused the break, who, what kind of style does the repair in, how did it fail, and you can use that kind of forensic technique to start building up a biography of the use of the instrument, and that can tell you a lot about the music that it played. This is the second of the pair. This one's called the Queen Mary Harp because it has this big story associated with it. It says about how Mary, Queen of Scots, presented it to its owner and all that kind of thing. 
So it's not in such bad condition. It does have a lot of breaks and a lot of repairs. You can see that there are cracks. See right at the bottom left, there's a missing part that's been replaced. There's a notch cut out of it in the middle. If you look top right, I don't know if you can see, there's a, like a crack that runs from that inner curve. <coughs> so, so, so there are breaks. They have been repaired. It has been used. It also has its, its sort of life story on display. With more subtly. Wait, so when did these two parts date to? We have no idea. Okay. <laughs> We have no idea. So, um, so uh, after Karen Loomis's four years or so of forensic work of these, we have we, we're narrowing it down. But the the, the, the next task that Destiny needs done is carbon dating of the wooden components because that really would tell us when they were made. But we have no idea. So, so what? So one way to date them is by art history, comparative art history. But they're so unique; it's really hard. So one thing you can do is you see the, um, the interlace and the leaves carved on the curved front pillar. Okay. These are quite diagnostic and distinctive, and these match late 15th century Iona school West Highland carving. So you can say fairly confidently, yeah, that, that carved decoration was done in Iona or in its sphere of influence between 1450 and 1500, that kind of time. But is that when that wooden component was actually made, or was it redecorated later? And the, and the half is made from these three main components. And so, which one of them is a replacement, and which is original? These, these are the things that, we, that we're still wondering about. So my suspicion is that, is that this half is old, significantly older than 1450, but I can't prove that. It's just, I'm just guessing wildly. And one day we'll find out, I think. So to give you a, a hint of the kind of the kind of forensics that Karen Lewis has been doing, this is this is one of her images from her article in the Galpin Society Journal. Um, to to put the hearts through um, a CT scanner to get kind of 3D X-rays, and then you can see uh, all the internal details. So you can see the in the shape of the internal sound box. You can see the way that the three pieces of wood slot together with these mortise and tendon joints. You can see some of the repairs at the bottom left. There's a whole mass of iron straps to clamp it together where it's de deformed and distorted. You can see all the woodworm holes. Because both of these two old hearts are totally middle of the woodworm. Okay. So there's no possibility of putting strings on and bringing them up to pitch and playing them. Because they're so, so fragile. I mean, even if they weren't middle of the woodworm, we still wouldn't do it because the act of stringing and playing it would destroy so much ancient forensic evidence. It would be like going to a crime scene and reenacting the crime before the forensic people are coming. Yeah? And so and so 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 this is the rationale for me having this thing, okay, because because I want to I want to handle it, I want to put strings on, I want to try playing it and tuning it to understand how, how it works as a musical instrument. And I can't do it with that thing because it's too ancient and precious. But I can have a if I commission an exact copy, as exact as possible in every archaeological sense, then I can, I can fiddle around with this as much as I like and, and use it in one mind. Okay. So this is my archaeological res research tool to try and understand this physical nature of the musical instrument. And if by doing that, I think I can discover something about the music. Because a, a musical instrument is always designed to play a certain type of music, isn't it? Because if you want to play different music, you get a different type of instrument. Think of guitars. Think of how if you're if you're in a rock band, you're not going to get a lovely Spanish flamenco guitar because it's not going to do what you want it to do. So you're going to go specifically shopping for the right kind of instrument to suit your music. And so my idea is the medieval West Highland harpist would use a harp like this because it specifically suited the kind of music they wanted to do. So you can do a kind of reverse engineering process. You can say, well, if we understand the instruments, then we understand their choices in selecting that instrument, then we get an insight into what their musical priorities were. Does that make sense? 
Okay, I see there's two ancient harps in Scotland. There are three really ancient harps, all told. But you already know about the third one. Because you see it every night in the pub, on the Guinness labels. Okay, so this is, this is the harp in Dublin, which is the Irish national symbol. And, it, and it's, a, it's almost a match pair for the Queen Mary harp in the Museum of Edinburgh. And that's very interesting to me, that there are these two very ancient, definitely medieval harps, and they're almost identical in lots and lots of very interesting ways. There are similar, those two, if you get two violins and you look at them side by side, they're kind of the same, aren't they? They both have to scroll, they both have to the echo, they both have the points, they have the same number of strings, they have the same tuning, they're the same ergonomics. And so these two harps are the same in that way. The details are different, you know, they're made by different makers in different workshops, they have slightly different decoration on them, but they're, to all intents and purposes, identical as working musical instruments. And that's, that's very interesting to give, you that, give us again that connection between the Scottish and the Irish shared tradition. Okay, so I said there are three really ancient parts, but there's probably about 18 or so in total if, if we include later instruments, okay? Cause because I'm most interested in the medieval tradition, but we have to look at the tradition as a whole, really, to get a proper overview. So this gives us a sense of, there at the top of our medieval instruments, okay, and, and our stone carvings, and then as we move through, the, the instruments get bigger, more complicated, you get this whole development in the 17th century that I mentioned on Tuesday, that everything changes, the music changes, we have the arrival of the Italian Baroque style, this is a handout sheet, you know, you'll get the, hand, the handout on the system, so you can... There's a little bit more on it than this, but it's just to give us something to talk about. Um, there's, there's a few little points that you, can, that you can draw out from this. So, you can see how after 1650 the shape of the instrument changes. You have a much bigger harp. You've all heard of Caroline, the Irish harper. This, this third line, this third line, this is his tradition. Okay, so, so this is the this is the big 18th century Irish harp tradition, is exemplified by by that third line development. Any any other observations or comments that you can notice about this one? And the, Go back to the beginning and think of, think of the harp. Who, who plays the harp? Ladies. Yeah. Ladies. Yeah, these are all men. Okay. So, so this is another thing that's very interesting. There's often a perception that the harp is a ladies' instrument. But why is that? There's nothing gendered about the harp itself. And yet we have this preconception. And yet when you look at the old tradition, it's always men. And that's, and that's, that's, that, that's nothing to be surprised by, right? because it wasn't, even, it wasn't an amateur aristocratic instrument primarily, although obviously amateur aristocrats did play it. It was a professional instrument. Remember I was saying it's learned, it's scholarly, it's intellectual, it's connected to patronage. But most of the harpers, I think, would have been professionals performing in the pay of aristocrats of their big houses. So we have to we have to stop thinking it's it's not like our lute lady that we saw on Tuesday, the aristocratic amateur lady. This is the professional, learned, intellectual man who's studied formally for a number of years to learn this tradition. You know, so, so it's it's like when it's like a conservatory music classical musician nowadays. It's that level of professional development and accomplishment. Now. You'll notice that this one kind of comes to an end, 1650 to 1800. So what happens after 1800? Where's, where's the next line of this development of the old native tradition? And the answer is, after 1800, this tradition comes to an end. Okay? So that this whole this ancient heart tradition from medieval times right down to 1800, it stops. And it comes to a complete halt. Okay? So these last guys, so, so this, this chap here, He's, he's one of the last working in the old tradition. 
he had students. Around 1800, they set up schools because they could see the tradition was dying. And so there was an attempt to get young people in. And so this chap, Arthur O'Neill, was employed to teach these young boys. But, you know, it was a kind of doomed thing because musical tastes have changed. And into the 19th century, you have the whole rise of romantic music. And this ancient, ancient tradition was just too old fashioned and really clunky. And so, and so it really did die out and come to an end. And they came to a point where there was nobody who could play the old Scottish and Irish harp. And it being an oral tradition, to be able to play it, you had to learn from a living master. So it came to an end. But because the 19th century was, was romantic time, everybody wanted the harp. They wanted the symbol and they wanted it alive. And yet there was nobody who could play it. And the tradition was dead. So what do you do? You make it up. Okay, so here we are in a fantasy world. But you, you've got the symbol. You want it to live. You don't know how to. You just make it up from nothing. So, um, so there's a whole series of attempts to reinvent the harp in the Scottish and Irish context. Starting, starting even before the old tradition had died out, we put the old to be disconnected. So we have John Egan in Dublin, and, and, and he invents a new Irish harp. Nothing to do with the old tradition. Basically, he was a continental type, continental pedal harp maker, and so he just said, well, this should get, and then it looks romantic, but we don't have to deal with the nitty gritty of the actual relearning the old native traditions. So this is, a, this is a fascinating story of the harp from the early 19th century down to the present day, is this mismatch between we want the ancient ambience, but we don't want to actually deal with the ancient traditions, so we just make it up and use modern cosmopolitan international traditions to try and get that up and running. So again, this is a handout on the sheet, so I'll move swiftly on, and I'll show you a little bit more detail about about these revival attempts. So I think this is the first real attempt at reviving in Scotland. So this would be about 1800. The type tradition in Scotland died out earlier than in Ireland. So by the time Margaret and Anna Jane, two sisters, they were wards of Sir Walter Scott. They helped him with research of his novels. They lived on Mull. They were part of an aristocratic family. They were Gaelic speakers. They were they were interested in the local folklore. They knew about the harp. They knew about the harp as an ancient symbol, as a repository of Gaelic music law. But it was totally dead. So what do you do? Well, you write to London and say, please send me a harp. And so up comes the, the big Eden, the big Erard pedal harp. And they, and they were proficient classical musicians. They could play the piano. They could make arrangements. And so they played the harp airs that they collected from singers and from oral tradition, they played them on their pedal harp. Okay. And nowadays we think that's kind of slightly odd. It seems weird to be using a big cosmopolitan London pedal harp to play old Gaelic classic repertory. I don't think they would have thought it bit weird at all because it's a harp. And what other kind of harp is there? What other kind of harp is available to them? Nothing. And so they're quite happy with this. And I think that's, that's very interesting. This is kind of neglected start of the revival. Because everyone, because, because the symbolism is so strong, and so we now have a, this strong idea of the classic as a small harp and it was a visual icon, and so this doesn't really fit our modern preconceptions of how things work, but I think this is important as a step. It's a step along, and it shows very vividly what they're doing. They're using whatever modern, international, classical type resources they can get to get the symbol up and running without worrying about the technicalities. Here is John Egan in Dublin. You see John Egan made pedal harps. And he thought and he made pedal harps and he decorated with the shamrocks to make them more Irish. But you could tell that he's thinking this is not quite right. This is this is too obviously a continental import. You have to make it look more ancient. And so what he's done is he's taken the entire principle of an orchestral pedal harp and he's just chopped it and given it curvy, romantic-looking bits. But it has all the mechanism of a pedal harp. You see this finger 
levers on the inside. These are connected with a really complicated mechanism up the inside to turn all those little twiddles at the top. And it makes, means you can change key like mad, and you can do all your, all your romantic chord progressions and cadences. And you can see our lady playing it, very Jane Austen style. She could be quite at home playing a big pedal harp. And, but, but she would play this instrument instead to make her look more ancient and Celtic. But from a technical point of view, there's no difference between those two things. It's just a visual, symbolic difference. So there was this kind of flurry of interest in the early 19th century, and then it died out again. And so there seems to be a big hole in the late 19th century, and I still don't understand exactly why that is. So the old tradition was dead, 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 and the revival kind of slept for a bit. And then in the 1890s, there was a great Celtic revival of all kinds, in art, in literature, in music. You have the invention of the mod, the, the competition of the Gaelic scene. In Ireland, there's a similar movement with, with the competitions and the festivals. And so people wanted harps, they wanted the classic to live again, but they had no idea what to do. And so, that, so one, of the, one of the quirks of history is that, is that some of them are thinking, okay, so, so how do you get the classic up and running? Well, you look back. You look back for ancient models. And in Ireland, they look back for ancient models, and what did they find? But this thing, oh, this is oh, great. Here's the thing we can copy and we'll be getting it right. And they didn't realize that this thing itself was a kind of fantasy infection from 80 years earlier. It's, it's kind of amusing. I guess in Scotland they did one better because they looked back and they saw the Queen Mary half in the museum. So this is... Uh, to, um, and yet you have to have somebody to make it. So what do you do? You write up to the London pedal harp maker and say, please make me a harp, and I want it to look like this. Okay? And so this is what's happening here. Is this is George Harnack, and he's made a harp that looks fairly good. You know, you glance at it, you think, oh yes, like Queen Mary harp. But yet, technically, it's a pedal harp. Okay? So the, so the way it's made, the way it's played, you can, you can see Amy Murray and the way she's sitting. If you took that harp away from her and put a pedal harp in front of her, she wouldn't have to move a muscle. It would all work. Okay? Very different from the kind of posture and the kind of attitude and the kind of the, the way of controlling the instrument from the old position. This idea, this idea carried on, so here we are in the 1930s. Marjorie Kennedy Fraser was out doing her song collecting in the Western Isles, and, and she would do concerts with the piano, and her daughter would tap up the piano, and they thought, wouldn't it be better if we had a harp? And so, again, here we go, the, the Irish style of harp, I think it was technically a little bit more acoustically pleasant, and so it kind of takes over from that medieval-looking Scottish version. But it's the same deal, it's, it's, it's this modern continental style of stringing, playing, the, the touch and everything. And Hello Ice Russell Ferguson plays Marjorie Kennedy Fraser's music as well. She's very interesting, she's a fascinating, fascinating woman. She made recordings into the 60s, she kind of got into psychedelic and improvisational kind of music. And she's very neglected nowadays and it's hard to get her music, but there's a big research project into her and her music. And Henry Briggs was a very good violin maker, and he turned his attention to harps. And so here he is with that one of the harps that he made. And you can see that he's changing the shape of it. He's being very progressive. He's thinking, he's thinking these are all the ones not that acoustically good. We can, we can improve their structure, we can improve their sound. And so he, he modifies the shape. Alison Kinnair got one of his harps in the late 70s, I think, when it was already an antique, and she still plays it today because it's a good instrument. And so musicians like, well, Alison especially, starting, this is just, just starting out in the late 70s, this is from one of her first records, and she's still playing today, and she's still one of the main exponents of the modern Scottish harp tradition. Being very scholarly, being very intelligent about it, thinking about the, 
old music and how it fits with old traditions. And yet, most of the time using the modern instrument. So I'm very interested in that there's, there's, there's so many different threads and strands that come together. And, and all the time, there's, there's this attempt to, re, to, to bring back to life the ancient tradition in the modern world. And so one of the big questions in studying the harvest of them is how do, you, how do you do that? How do you take something ancient and make it live again? And so I've shown you in these series of slides slightly different attitudes to taking the ancient thing and making it live again, from the refrain to the vain sisters just playing on a pedal harp to the look-alike thing, to seriously thinking about the sound of the old tradition, the, the kind of sonorities and the kind of idioms in old, old traditional music. So what I'm doing, and I kind of did it by accident from my archaeology background, is to think, well, actually, I would like to ignore everybody else's attempts to get it working again and start from first principles. Okay? So it's only quite a more recent thing that I've started studying, the, the revival from 1800 up to the present day. Most of the work that I've been doing has been deliberately ignoring that revival and trying to get the ancient stuff up and running on its own terms, using a kind of archaeological approach. This is why I have the replica of the heart, an, an, an uncompromised replica. So I've deliberately made this as accurately as possible as I can to the one in the museum, and then I have to deal with actually making it work as a musical instrument, which is not easy. It's much easier for the, at the instrument maker stage to change things and make it work better. But I didn't want that, I wanted to see how the original works. So, it's quite a difficult instrument to get up and running to make it work. You can see it's, cut, it's sculpted from just three pieces of wood. The, the strings are made of metal wire. This is the, the old tradition in Ireland and Scotland, right back to medieval times. <coughs> Whereas the modern tradition used to use gut or substitutes like nylon. And so these all have a big effect on the sound of it. The strings are made close together. The, 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 the touch and the feel of playing it is very different from a modern harp, to the extent that I'm not sure it's, it's that easy to transition between them. So I can't, I can't play the modern harp, and I've never bothered learning to try, because this is the instrument that I want to understand. So, to give you an example of it, I'll play one of the most important, one of the most important tunes in the old repertory. And so, I mentioned this old tradition, and that there's nothing, there's no, there's no book. The old, there is not a single piece of written music written by one of the old harpers from Scotland and Ireland. There's nothing. Okay. It was totally, totally an oral tradition. And deliberately so, because it wasn't, it's not a folk tradition, it's not a low status tradition, it's an aristocratic, learned art music tradition that is deliberately unwritten. And that's interesting. That's interesting in its own light that you, that you can have such a thing, that you can think about how would such a thing work. But it's also interesting from a bringing it back to life point of view because you can't just go and get the Harper's book and put it up on the music stand and play through it. Because there is no book. And even if there was, it wouldn't be right to put it up on the music stand and play for it because that's not what the old guys were doing. They were deliberately not working with written text. So one of my main sources is these manuscripts. This is uh, the Irish music collector Edward Bunting met the last of the old Irish harpists in the 1790s. And he saw their music was dying, he saw it was very <coughs> beautiful, and he thought, I will go and write it down. So he would sit beside them in their cottage and he would transcribe at full speed what they were playing. And you can see on the top manuscript, this is what's happening. He's got titles, he's scribbling down titles, he's scribbling down anything they say, like telephone doodling. And then you see in the top left hand corner, they start playing, and he's just dotting at full speed. So this is like a kind of live field transcript of our harper playing. Uh, and then I imagine him saying, that was lovely, but can you do it again, but a bit slower, please? And then he manages to actually write down the note values, but he's still very scribbling. 
So, so that's what these, these pages represent. This is two different transcriptions from two different harpers playing the same tune. And these are live field transcripts at speed. So these are the kind of things I'm working on to try and... I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine what does a harper play that causes Bunting to write this, to reverse engineering, to try and play it on the harp. So I'll play you the top one. So it's a series of variations. It's connected to key work on the bagpipe. You have then ground, you have a geometric variation. And then this is DC, and you repeat the, you repeat the ground. This is one of the um, one of the beginners' tunes. This is one of the tunes that is taught, that supposedly, according to the informants, was traditionally taught to the young harpers. So that's interesting as well. Um, I think it's a kind of fossil that it was taught to young harpers as part of their formal curriculum. I don't think it was a performance piece in the 18th century. I think it's I think it's a kind of fossilized remnant of an older style of music. So. I could spend a whole lifetime studying this tune in mm -hmm. different, different versions. Um, so and then the second, the second setting from a different harper has, uh, has different features, it has different variations. So you get an idea of the flexibility of the oral tradition, the way you can improvise variations of how set is it, how fixed is it. So we look, we look for different versions, we try and chase it through. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on this on this repertory. Okay? This work is only just beginning and still we're all still just exploring around the edges. Or even trying to catalogue what we've got before we can we can start to analyse it and understand it properly. So when, when there's a tune that you're interested in from the old harp tradition that is in Bunting's manuscripts it's like you've hit gold because there you have the live field transcript of an, of an old harper in the old tradition playing it. Okay? And this, this basically says, yeah, this is how this tune works in the old tradition on the harp. And this is I do less of that because I'm not so interested in the 18th century Irish repertory, but my colleagues in Ireland who are interested in the 18th century Irish harp repertory, the music of Caroline and the harp of composers, this is, this is enough work for 10 PhDs, which haven't yet been done. Okay. Um, so, so this is a huge resource, a resource for understanding the old Gaelic heart traditions, and like I say, it's, it's almost untouched. It's not very often that you come across a subject that's so rich and so important and so resonant with so many people. Everybody loves Caroline, everyone loves the Irish harp, everybody loves the classic, and yet, and, and there's such a rich resource 
of primary source materials, and there's almost nothing we know of it from a scholarly point of view. Nothing. And that's kind of interesting. And I think it goes back to the symbolism thing, that people are almost scared to deal with the real thing because the symbol is so powerful. If you go to the National Museum in Ireland, they have a wonderful collection of 18th century Irish harps. They have harps that were played by our contemporaries. And they're all in the store. And they have the Egan romantic fantasies on display in the gallery. Because people who go to the museum don't want to see the real thing battered and ancient and blackened. They want to see the gilded green shamrock decorative food fruit. And I think that's very interesting as well. That the real thing is still so hidden because the symbol is so strong. I was going to say a little more about Burns Marsh, so I, so I got distracted. So, so, the, so, so when you have a tune that's in the manuscript, you're sorted. You look at the, you look at the field draft, you try and play what's written, and you've got the tradition. Most tunes that we're interested in, especially in Scotland, are not represented in Bunting's manuscripts of 18th century Irish harp music. Therefore, we have a much more difficult task. But I use Burns Marsh as an example because you can see, you can see here, here's what we want the live transcript of the old half of playing. This is what we usually get, some printed setting for another instrument. Okay. Now this is much harder to deal with as harp music. Okay. So the top one is a pipe setting, and the bottom one is a vocal setting, but both of them have been tweaked for printing. Okay. So this is like, I, I hinted at this in due to the lecture, that you can, you can take these source texts in lots of different ways. And at the moment, I'm not at all interested in who a Farrell was and what his pipe style was like. I don't care. What I want to know is how can I reverse engineer this to get a harp version? And it's very hard. And you end up having to know about who a Farrell was. And you have to know what his pipe style was because that affects how he handled the tune and how he changed it. But what I really want to do is get beyond that to get to the underlying harp melody. And I think you can see that actually that's really difficult. And so all of the Scottish harp repertory survives in sources like this, that are at removed at one or two or three steps from the harp original. And you have to, you have to try and reimagine them and reconstruct a plausible original. And that's very hard to do without knowing what the, without having the original as a reference point. So you can do it with the Irish stuff, because you have buntings field draft as a reference point. But then the further away from that you go, the harder it gets. So it's a great challenge for me to try and get Scottish harp repertory up and running. There, there are Scottish sources for Burns March. So this is fun to try and make the connection. So these are, these are three arrangements of it from Scottish sources. And you, and you can look at the titles, you can think about the titles, you can look at the musical text, you can think about that, you can think about their provenances. But it's, it's a difficult work. But I think it's possible. It's difficult. I think that's me done, but I said if, if anyone's got any questions or if there's anything that I've missed. Or if there's anything that isn't clear in the last minute or two. Yeah? What exactly is a pedal part and how is it? The pedal harp is the kind of harp you see in the orchestra. Okay? So if you're to an orchestra concert and there'll be a harp in the back, and it's basically it's basically an industrial classical music instrument. So so it's this big and it uses a industri you know, it, it, you can play it and you can fill a big concert hall with sound. And it has a very, very complicated mechanism controlled by foot pedals that allows you to change key to any key. So you can do all kinds of key changes, you can play any key, you can do classical chord progressions and functional harmony. Okay. It's very confusing because it's called a harp, and ours is called a harp, and they're not it's all the same. Okay. But it's part, it's part of the symbolism of <coughs> the harp, but it's not. It's, harp is a generic term as much as as much as platinum, you know, the fretted instrument. So you think, oh yeah, you've got a guitar, you've got a cello, you've got a violin, you've got a sitar, and they're all the same, aren't they? Okay. Because you've got the harp, and this, the harps are all the same. 
is, is that is that level of difference and confusion. Okay. Any other questions? Are you happy? Thank you very much.